Hi, my name is Daniel Blackburn and today I'm going to talk to you about phosphorus and how this important plant nutrient moves across ecosystems. Okay, so this video is uh, part of the course SWAE4401 Water and Nutrient Cycling in Soil Plant Environment. So we're going to split the phosphorus lecture in two videos. The first one, this one, will be about the importance of phosphorus, its role in plant physiology, and also the biogeochemical cycle of phosphorus. Uh, how does it, what are the transformations of phosphorus in soil environments, and how does it affect the availability of phosphorus for plants? So in the next video, I'm going to talk about the human impact on the, on the phosphorus cycle, how to manage phosphorus fertility and phosphorus as a non-renewable natural resource. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, in short, phosphorus is uh, uh, atomic mass 31, on the, uh, number 15 on the periodic table. Uh, although we have allotropic forms of phosphorus, the, what we usually find in natural environments is phosphate ions, yeah, phosphate molecules, or organic phosphorus, which are, in general, uh, the phosphate making steric bonds with uh, carbon uh, uh, molecules in the organic matter. But phosphate is actually the moieties that are used for uh, living beings, uh, very importantly, in most of the energy transfer molecules uh, and also many other uh, uh, proteins and um, in the phospholipids also. Uh, phosphate is, uh, it comes in two types. You know, it, depend, it depends on the pH of the environment. You will have uh, a relative abundance of one or the other. And the difference is uh, the level of protonation of the molecule. If you, if you are in more acidic pH below 6.5, you will see a higher abundance of the H2 pure 4 minus, uh, but if you are a neutral in alkaline pH, you will see more abundance of the H pure 4 2 minus. Yeah? And this changes a little bit the chemistry of the phosphorus on the environment. The, the orientation of the hydrogen on the phosphate molecules can vary, um, so it's a kind of a very flexible molecule in, in this sense that you can make a lot of different uh, three-dimensional configurations and a uh, lot of different uh, chemical bonds. So because of this, phosphorus is a very, very reactive molecule and um, it helps a lot in, in, in many different reactions intracellularly and also in the environment is really well bonded to many other uh, different types of particles. Phosphorus in plants, you will find that phosphorus in plants is not a very huge abundance, but the importance is really high. Other nutrients, such as calcium, potassium, and, in, and even non-essential nutri uh, nutrients like silicon, are in much higher abundance than phosphorus. Uh, but nonetheless, we usually say that phosphorus is a much more important for plants than calcium and potassium, for example, even though it's present in uh, lower concentrations. And the reason for that is because of the roles, the physiological roles that we have uh, of phosphorus in, the, in plant uh, tissues. Phosphorus has a very variable role uh, on, this, uh, on, this, on the plant physiology. Basically, it's integral part of the backbone of DNA and RNA. It's not part of the basis, but it's uh, binding the sugars as the, 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 the backbone of the DNA. It's also present in energy transfer molecules, the ATP and ADP. The P on ATP and ADP stands for phosphorus, yeah, phosphate. It's present in phospholipids. The phospho in phospholipids, it corresponds for the phosphate. It gives the hydrophilic property of the phospholip phospholipid head. So it's a very important on the arrangement, the three-dimensional arrangement of cell membranes. Uh, it's uh, highly present and involved in molecular signaling 
uh, mainly through inos phosphates. The phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of inos phosphates uh, is used as molecular signing um, and also it's present in proteins as phosphorylated proteins. Yeah? So all these different roles makes that phosphorus is um, highly flexible and highly important in an array of different um, reactions and, and biochemical functions inside the cell. Making phosphorus uh, highly essential and uh, without phosphorus we don't have any way of having life because of all these different essential roles it has. So what happens if the plant lacks phosphorus? If it's starving for phosphorus? First thing is you will have less plant growth. Yeah, if you have, this is a very exaggerated figure, but in, in uh, monocotyledons, uh, you will have, you may find some color changes for a purplish color change. But usually you don't see it in, in, in the majority of plants. What you only see for phosphorus is uh, actually less biomass, um, uh, thinner stems, and uh, the color does not change too much, but it's just like smaller plants overall. This is in lettuce, how you see, less phosphorus, just smaller leaves, for, as you see. Also in beans, less phosphorus, just uh, uh, less biomass in general. Yeah, so this is the, the symptom of phosphorus deficiency. It's very hard to tell unless you are dealing one, with some uh, uh, sorghum or uh, maize, then you will maybe see some purplish color on the leaves, but otherwise phosphorus only symptom uh, externally would be that it will have less biomass, less growth overall. So the biogeochemical cycle of phosphorus is, uh, we could say that it's a one direction cycle. In, in geological terms, uh, within a, a human lifetime, you will not see a full cycle of uh, phosphorus through the environment. That, it means that the, the, the reason for this is phosphorus is nearly absent in the atmosphere. It's very, uh, the concentration of uh, phosphorus containing gases is absolutely very low, below limit of detection in most uh, environments. And normally the majority of the phosphorus in the environment cycles through the water and the earth uh, crust, yeah, the earth crust. So uh, begins the, the cycle begins with uh, rock phosphate that uh, uh, it's been weathered, and uh, it's it's a source of phosphorus for the soils. The weathering of this uh, rock phosphate, this uh, rock phosphate weather releases phosphate into the environment. This phosphate is then uh, uptaken by uh, plants and, and eaten by animals in cycles in the soil environment through these um, different organisms. Um, these these um, decomposers uh, degrade the organic molecules uh, containing phosphorus back into inorganic phosphorus and eventually this phosphorus is lost to the waters. And when it's lost to waters then it will uh, precipitate and uh, form sediments uh, r rich in phosphorus. These sediments uh, will be will stay on the bottom of the ocean until some geological uplifting brings the sediments to the surface as a form of rock phosphate, and then the cycle starts again. So it takes millions of years for this full cycle to happen. And in a given soil environment or water environment, the 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 one phosphate molecule can be trapped. Uh, through thousands of years, uh, thousands of years. So um, it's a very slow cycle and, and it's a um, slow moving cycle, as you say. So because we are only looking in phosphorus moving from rocks to soils to water to sediment, uh, uh, and it takes so long for these sediments to become rocks again and start the weathering process, we say that the phosphorus cycle is like a unidirectional cycle. It's just coming from the rocks to the soils to the waters into the sediments of the oceans or lakes. If we focus now on the soil environment, we can see different processes happening. Yeah. So you have here, this looks a little bit complex, but I will break this down for you. Uh, you have different pools of phosphorus in, in the environment. You have solution, soil solution phosphorus. 
uh, uh, present as uh, phosphate, but also as organic phosphorus molecules. But soil solution phosphate is the one that is available for plants and, to my, and also uh, available for microbes. Yeah? This phosphate solution, uh, 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 phosphate in soil solution, can be uh, absorbed into the, the sol soil solid phase, can be precipitated with uh, different ions, calcium and magnesium in alkaline conditions, iron and aluminum in acid conditions, can be integrated and absorbed into the microbial biomass, uh, can uh, also be released from fresh organic phosphorus, which is not, no, not a living organic matter, but um, uh, fresh organic matter, recently dead, let's say. Um, also, stable organic phosphorus has a, 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 is a big pull on the environment, and its cycle into solid solution phosphorus is very slow. So how do these phosphorus arrive on the system? Here are the inputs. You can have mineral fertilizers, you can have weathering of minerals, you can have uh, atmospheric deposition, a very small amount of atmospheric deposition. Uh, we have manures and biosolids. And the exports from this system, you have harvest, uh, uh, erosion, and leaching. Yeah? Harvest, ex uh, erosion, and leaching. So here it's the, are the, the main uh, uh, components of the cycle organized. Yeah, you have different pools of phosphorus, including the, the, the solution phosphorus, soil solution phosphorus, which is the plant available pool. Uh, and uh, you have uh, different inputs of phosphorus, how phosphorus enters the soil environment, and different outputs, how the soil, the phosphorus leaves the soil environment. Uh, let's break down some of these uh, uh, components a little bit more. So you have uh, the, the weathering as the primary source of phosphate, uh, phosphorus to the soil environment. The weathering means the decomposition of the rocks. Yeah? So you have chemical and, and physical weathering. The chemical weather will be the one which will be releasing the phosphate into the soil solution. Yeah? So the rocks are being slowly br uh, uh, breaking down and uh, these different minerals, including the phosphorus, have been released by acid solubilization, hydrolysis, and oxidation reactions. Yeah, oxidation reactions. This uh, chemical weathering is not solely uh, a, a chemical process; it's a biochemical process also. Here is a figure from Smith et al. 2012, showing that the plants associated with mycorrhiza. Uh, will be able to identify when you have uh, primary minerals containing uh, phosphorus or uh, 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 any mineral containing phosphorus actually and channel the exudation of uh, uh, organic acids into the soil exactly on the region where it finds the, these phosphorus uh, compounds, these phosphorus minerals. And by doing this, it, it, it promotes, it enhances the weathering of these minerals into phosphate. And so this is a biological process which is causing directly inducing chemical weathering in the soil. So it's a biological weathering. Uh, it's also a chemical weathering. So whenever you have uh, phosphate minerals near the surface, microbes and plants will act directly on them as uh, a way of uh, uh, dissolving these minerals into, uh, this, um, into the, 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 the available forms of phosphate in the soil. Uh, atmospheric deposition is very low. We have some, we have some, um, some very small amount of uh, uh, dry deposition and this dry deposition comes with dust. In some environments where the, 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 the mother rock, the rock material underlying the soil is very poor in phosphorus, atmospheric deposition can be a big source of uh, phosphorus. One example is for, uh, in the Central America, some of the, the tropical forests, the rainforest that you have there, 
they are they are very uh, limited in phosphorus, and actually throughout the, the 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 years, one of the main sources of phosphate to these soils is dust coming from the Sahara des Desert. Yeah, and this atmospheric deposition is a very uh, uh, it's a slow process, but can be import important if the ecosystem is very low in phosphorus and if you have a huge amount of dust arriving from phosphate-rich environments. Yeah? Uh, this is the, 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 the big question here, uh, the, what about phosphine? Phosphine is a phosphorus gas and it's speculated to pay, uh, play a big role in um, in some environments, phosphine is formed in uh, very reducing conditions, let's say in, in swamps and um, also composting facilities. Sometimes you might find you have to have high phosphorus concentration in uh, highly reducing conditions. You might have some phosphine gas going on and happening here. But mostly it's below detection limit and you don't expect to have much uh, phosphine. You recently may have heard the, the detection of phosphine on uh, Venus atmosphere. So this is a bioindicator and there's some speculation that there might be some microbes in Venus that are producing this phosphine. Yeah? But usually the, the atmospheric depositions it is through dust. And we the, the type of research that is done uh, to, to um, uh, find out the deposition throughout the past it's normally done using ice cores from uh, glaciers and you can date back every layer in this ice core and find out which were the periods which had more atmospheric deposition. And normally the periods with more atmos atmospheric deposition are the periods of uh, the, when you have um, uh, uh, long uh, glacier periods. Yeah? The long glacier periods where the oceans uh, retreat and you have the exposition of the sediments and the, some of the deserts become drier, uh, this dust high in phosphorus can uh, move throughout the, the, the earth and deposit in other, uh, other places. So there's more, uh, more atmospheric deposition through the glacial periods uh, than in the interglacial periods. In the soil, you have that the plants are affecting the phosphorus uh, behavior, solubility, and availability in many different ways. This figure I've showed you in the last lecture about the soil chemistry and uh, uh, how it affects the plant nutrition. But roots are actively changing the, the, the soil chem uh, uh, chemistry uh, through pH changes, organic acid exudation, uh, um, enzyme uh, secretion, uh, production of siderophores and surfactants that increase the solubility of phosphorus. And the microbial biomass is doing similarly uh, the same things through phosphobacteria and fungi. Yeah? And this communication, this absorption of phosphorus is a process that is regulated by two things. One is desorption uh, and the diffusion. The plants are de uh, depleting the soil solution and there is diffusion happening and desorption happening and at the same time you have the microbial biomass regulating this uptake by, by um, interfering in this desorption, diffusion and the mineralization of organic phosphorus. So how, how this uh, mineralization happens, the mineralization carried out by microbes mainly uh, is the cleavage of the steric bonds between the phosphate and organic molecules, you know, making the phosphate molecules bioavailable, available to plants and to the microbes. Uh, the, the main type of enzymes that carry this out are phosphatases, and they come in, in many different types, depending on how is the, the, the source of the organic molecule carrying the phosphate. It's a fight, if it's a phytate, the enzyme is called the phytase. If it's a DNA, it's called the nuclease, a nuclease or endonuclease. If it's a, a, a phospholipid, it could be a PTP phosphatase, for example. And uh, you have also ATP and sugar phosphatases, which are normally considered to be very uh, labile phosphorus sources. So ATP and sugar phosphates 
or not very stable in soils, whereas you can have that phytate could last in soil for a long time. So organic phosphorus molecules, they have different um, bioavailability depending on how often can they, how, how quick can they be hydrolyzed by soil microbes. Some of these same molecules can be cycled at different speeds depending on uh, the, the counter iron in which they are uh, associated with. If a phytate molecule is uh, precipitated with a calcium or an aluminum or a, 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 the type of precipitate that it makes, Will, it will make it easier or harder to be hydrolyzed. Or if this, uh, also these molecules are absorbed into the solid phase, they also change the, the, the bioavailability, their bioavailability. So also you, it's, it's important to say that these enzymes uh, that are being carried by different microbes, they have different properties and different microbes will be able to match the enzyme properties with the environmental conditions. Some may not. For example, if you have a bacillus enzyme, which has activity on the alkaline range, and this bacillus is growing in, in an acid soil, this enzyme may never be able to hydrolyze the phosphorus at the, uh, this environment. The, the opposite is also true. If you have, for example, an Aspergillus niger, uh, with activity on the acid range, and this aspergillus is growing in alkaline soil, like the ones in Oman, this aspergillus will not be able to hydrolyze the organic phosphorus. So the matching of the, the properties of the enzymes that these microbes carry with the conditions of the environment is very important for these microbes to be able to hydrolyze the phosphorus on this environment. Um, so, precipitation and adsorption are chemically the main forms in which phosphate becomes unavailable to plants. If you think about here the percentage of total phosphorus that is unavailable for plants, uh, uh, it's quite high. Just this small amount here on the bottom, it's the available phosphorus. All the rest, you know, between 10 and uh, uh, 20% of the phosphorus is available, let's say, up to 30% can be available depending on the texture, but all the rest is unavailable. In the, in the main processes that are uh, being uh, stabilizing this phosphorus in the soils are precipitation and adsorption. This precipitation and adsorption, th these are uh, pH dependent processes. So in acid conditions, you will have that th this phosphate is being uh, precipitated with iron and aluminum. Uh, in alkaline conditions, these are being precipitated with calcium and magnesium. And the absorption in hydrous oxides is uh, throughout the, the range of pH, but a little bit smaller at very alkaline pH. And the, the absorption in silicate clays is happening in all conditions throughout the pH range. Um, so, different uh, fixation of phosphorus that makes this phosphorus unavailable to plants, it's a pH-dependent process. It's a pH-dependent process. And we strive to keep the soil pH between this range of 6 and 7 because it's where, naturally, most of uh, you, you have the highest bioavailability of phosphorus in these conditions. So, as, uh, uh, as we were talking about, in, in acid conditions, you will have the precipitation of iron, of, of phosphates with iron and aluminum. And in alkaline soil, it will be with calcium and magnesium. Uh, this is the order of decreasing bioavailability of the calcium precipitates of, uh, with phosphate. So monocalcium phosphate will be the most available form of the precipitate forms and carbonate apatite would be uh, the least available form. So the longest these uh, uh, phosphates are precipitated on the soil, they tend to form more stable precipitates and they become part of the minerals of the soil, uh, insoluble mineral, minerals. So these insoluble phosphate molecules, uh, it takes a huge amount of energy from microbes and plants to mobilize them back into plant-available phosphate.
Uh, regarding the adsorption uh, mechanisms, uh, we already spoke about this in the soil chemistry, but it's worth reminding. Uh, phosphate can either be uh, uh, interacting uh, by the, in two different forms. Uh, it can make uh, inner sphere complexes, covalent bounds with the solid phase of the soils. Uh, and at the same time, it, this, this interaction with the surface can be bridged by NK, a cation because the phosphate molecule is uh, uh, negatively charged and uh, the surface of the clays are usually negatively charged. So it can be that a phosphate is binding to a calcium, for example, and the calcium is also binding the surface of this uh, um, adsorbent material, a clay and an oxide or whatever it is uh, on this system. So you can have that the, 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 the metals on the soil uh, help the phosphates to ad absorb. So this is called surface precipitation of, of the phosphorus. Yeah? So because of this mechanism, the absorption uh, and precipitation, most of the phosphorus in the soils, they are fixed in the solid phase. They are not in solution. Soil is, has very little mobility in soil. It does not move a lot. It moves very slowly in the soil. And when you apply fertilizer, you assume it will be one or two millimeters per year that the soil, the phosphorus will move. Because of this, uh, the phosphorus uh, does not go very deep. Yeah? It does not go very deep. If you apply the phosphate fertilizer in the surface, it will stay near the surface. And because it stays near the surface, it's easy to lose this phosphorus. And then when we lose this phosphorus, it is a big problem for the waters. Yeah? The nutrient pollution of waters is mainly being caused by nitrogen and phosphorus that are being uh, uh, eroded from the soils and uh, the receiving waters, uh, uh, the microbes are starving for these nutrients and then when the sediments arrive, the algae, they just go crazy. They, they, they grow by a huge amount. They take the oxygen from the water and the fish die in, in, in this process. This is called eutrophication. Yeah? When you enrich water, surface waters with nutrients, uh, this, uh, the microbes, the, the algae on the water will grow uh, disproportionately and uh, create an imbalance on the systems, killing other organisms present. Yeah? So, in oceans, these are called the dead zones. The dead zones in the oceans, we have a big one here in the Gulf of Oman. Uh, the dead zone is where the, the nutrients uh, promote the growth of algae, and these algae are uh, depleting the oxygen and killing the fish on this uh, environment. Yeah? Phosphorus is a big part of these eutrophication processes, so we need to think responsibly in how we manage agriculture to avoid creating nutrient pollution of waters. So to fi finalize this first part, you, the main concepts that you need to remember are chemical and bio uh, biological weathering uh, of uh, releasing phosphates, uh, immobilization and mineralization processes, precipitation and solubilization processes, adsorption and desorption, losses and eutrophication of waters. And you should try to focus within these uh, uh, processes what is the relationship between the chemistry, uh, plant availability, and the biological processes. So that is all for the first lecture. Uh, I will, uh, the next video will be the second part of the phosphorus uh, uh, subject. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.